We have been studying relationships for the last, um, I would say, three weeks. We got into February, and we've been looking at relationships. We've been studying relationships. We've been uh, examining relationships. And I think that today is the day I'm going to spend to sort of talk about romantic relationships, right? To discuss romantic relationships. I didn't want to do it on Valentine's because I thought it would be too, it's too cliche. It's too cliche, like, to come on Valentine's Day and then be talking about romance and all of this. So I, I, I always like to be different, and I like to break and buck the trend, and that's what I'm doing right now. So today I want to speak about sort of romantic relationships, soulmates, etc. And we're continuing the sermon series, like I mentioned, called Relationships. And I think that there are a lot of different descriptors that go around to describe these types of relationships. When I was young, well, I'm still young, but when I was younger, amen, we used to say, oh, this is my boyfriend, this is my girlfriend, this is my husband, this is my wife. And then, you know, we've transferred into sort of different terms. This is my partner, uh, this is my bae, this is my whatever. And I don't know which ones are better or worse, or if they are better or worse, but I know that things have changed. That is what I know. And I think that the term that we should use really that best qualifies what we're discussing is actually the term soulmate because that's what we're actually looking for and that's what God actually wants for us. And, you know, when we are talking about um, soulmates, we may not see that term in the pages of Scripture, right? You won't, you know, look in Genesis or Exodus or whatever and see that God said, you know, I, I brought you soulmates. But I think the concept... And the idea of a soulmate is there. And although the term is not present in Scripture, the concept of a soulmate is definitely there. And I think the question we should ask ourselves is not whether or not we believe in soulmates, but the question we should ask ourselves is whether we believe that God is a God who provides. Because if He is a God who provides and you are on that journey or you know somebody on that journey who is looking for their soulmate, then the question isn't whether soulmates exist. The question is whether God is a provider or not. And I believe that God is a provider. Can I get an amen? And I think we can agree without arguing, ladies and gentlemen, that God is a provider because that's who he is. That's his nature. To provide is like his character. It's inherent. That's God's authentic self. He can't help but provide. Everywhere God appears, there is a provision. And there's a man in the Old Testament, a prophet of God. His name is Abraham. And he has this really good relationship with God where he sees the provision of God, and he gives God a special name, which is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord that provides. So we have to understand that God is a God who brings provision. He's a God who is a provider. And that is the reason why if you're looking for something, whether it be an opportunity, whether it be an open door, or whether it be a person to add some um, completeness or complement uh, your life, we have to go to God and not go to the world because God is a provider. Can somebody say provider? Oh, say it with some gusto. Provider. Okay. So, he's God that provides. He's able to make provisions. He makes provisions when he needs to, even if he has to resort to unconventional means and terms, God will make a provision, right? That's the way he operates. Um, there is a fantastic story, or narrative, I should say, of, of a man named Moses leading people through the wilderness, and the people need water, and there's no water, and God says, strike a rock, and Moses strikes a rock, and water comes out of it. I want you to understand you are serving an unconventional God. He doesn't need to do things the way that we think they need to be done. God does things the way he wants to do them to demonstrate his power to provide even in situations where you think there is none, right? Even in situations where we think there's no possibility that God can do it, there's no possibility that God can provide, I am here to tell you that God is a provider. I want to hear it again. Somebody just say provider. I want you to have it in your mind because I'm going to dive 
kind of deep into the, the ability of God to provide. There's a man in the Bible called Paul. He's an apostle. And he makes this claim in the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 4, verse 19. He says, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. This is what he says. And I, I really want us to understand this. God will supply all my needs, not according to what I need and not according to what I already have, but he'll supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. It means that you never, your need never exceeds God's ability to provide. Amen. Your need will never exceed what God has in store. Your circumstance will never um, be too much for God to enter into and place what needs to be there, there. So this is why we should have ultimate and utmost confidence in God in every situation because his riches and glory is immeasurable, which means if you have something that needs to be filled, if there's a gap in your life which needs to be filled, whether it's an opportunity, whether it's to explore something, whether it's a business, whether it's a person, whatever it is, it means that God can fill that gap. And I want you to really take that in in 2023 because I know that people are want to accomplish great things. They want to do great things. They want to take a step ahead in life. And most of us think, well, I don't have the capacity to do it. Internally, I don't have what it takes to do it. But I want to tell you, it doesn't matter what you have. It matters what God has. And God has more than it. Oh, I thought somebody would be happy about this news. God has more than enough to deal with what you're dealing with. He has more than enough. I'm so confident in God. A lot of, a friend, like, a friend of mine was talking to me this week, and we're trying to put a, a bit of a project together, and I was saying to him, don't worry, it's going to work out. If it's, if it's meant to work out, it'll work out. And he's like, how are you so confident in this? How do you, why do you believe so much in this? And I said, because I believe in God. And if God wants something to work out, it is going to work out. Whether or not you believe it's going to work out, that is irrelevant. If God has something which is attached to your purpose, which is supposed to work out, it will work out. This is the Jehovah Jireh that Abraham was talking about, and this is the God that we're dealing with today. Hallelujah. So when we're talking about relationships and we're talking about this God who provides, we have to sort of ask ourselves the question, well, does this provision extend to relationships? Now, church, we're going to get into some touchy ground. Amen. We're going to get into some touchy ground. We're going to get into some relationship ground. And I know oftentimes people will go to anybody and everybody to get advice on their relationship. People will go to Oprah and her books. People will go to their best friend who uh, you know, has a terrible relationship track record. People will go to their parents. People will go to their friends. People will go to brothers. People will go to sisters. But what I've realized is oftentimes we should be going to God and we don't go to God. We don't go to the Bible because we think the Bible doesn't have anything to offer us in terms of romantic relationships. But I'm going to blow your mind today because I think the Bible is your guide to relationships and if any person comes to you and is like, I'm looking for my husband, I'm looking for my wife, I'm looking for my this, I'm looking for my dad, I'm looking for the next one, I'm looking for the best one, I want you to tell them to go to the Bible. Amen. And if you're, if you're in a relationship right now, if you're married, you're dating, whatever, whatever, I want to tell you that the Bible is the instrument, is the, the map, is the guide for you to find that person or keep that relationship uh, going the way God wants it to do, wants it to go. So I, I just want to, we have a, a bit of a special thing happening today, so I just want to go through this before we get to that. Now, listen, your relationship is about one thing. No, it's not your makeup. It's not your weave. It's not your bag. It's not how tall you are or how short you are. The success of your relationship and all your relationships depends on one thing, and that thing is your decisions, right? 
Your, the success of your relationship, whether it falters, whether it fades, whether it grows, whether it's great, depends only on your decisions. It's all about decision making because it's hard to have a good relationship with bad decisions. Let me repeat. It is hard to have a good relationship if we're making bad decisions. And I know that there are people who will say, well, Pastor John, it seems to me I keep dating the wrong type of person. And I am here to tell you that you are not dating the wrong type of person. You are deciding to bring the wrong type of person into your life. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, all of that is going to change starting today. Can somebody say amen? All right. Good decision making begins with having good self-awareness. You've got to be aware of who you are. You've got to be aware of who you are in life, what you are in life, where you want to go in life, and how you're supposed to get there in life. And not be delusional. And not allow yourself to be deluded about who you actually are, who you really are. Not allowing yourself to be deluded. Because when we're growing emotionally, spiritually, um, you know, mentally, etc., it's going to be messy. And the truth is, whether we want to hear it or not, we are all at times placed in a state of mess. Your evolution is messy. Your growth is messy. Uh, uh, your relationships are messy. But just because you are in a state or you're in a situation or you're in a phase of your life that seems messy, that doesn't mean you are making a mistake. In fact, sometimes the messier your life the more progress you're making. Because if you were in a life that wasn't of God or wasn't fulfilling your purpose, all of that has got to be torn down before you really walk into your purpose and you walk into what God has for you. So just because things seem messy, it doesn't mean you've made a mistake, right? It doesn't mean you've made a mistake. And some of us look back in our past and we think, well, Pastor John, my, my, my past is full of failures. I've, I've, I've failed so much. I've, I've caused so much. Uh, there's so many things I've tried and they didn't work. And I think we need to look at our failures as areas where we are allowing ourselves the opportunity to grow and not feel bad about ourselves and instead appreciate how far you've already come. You've come very far. You are not the same person you were last year because there's been growth spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. There's been growth. So you are not the same person you were five years ago, ten years ago, or five minutes ago. There's been growth. And we have to give ourselves um, appreciation of that. We have to appreciate that these areas that we call failures are actually areas and opportunities to grow. So don't think of yourself, well, I wasn't able to do that, so that means that's the end of that story. No, that means that's the beginning of that story because God is giving you an opportunity to improve in an area that will help you fulfill your purpose, right? And you know that you're really growing. Like me, I find myself, I know I'm really growing when I'm able to look back at things and I'm able to laugh instead of cry. Some of us, we get too emotional and wrapped. Oh, if I had done this five, if I had done this 10 years ago, if I had done this five years ago, oh, I shouldn't have missed that opportunity. Oh, I can't believe I missed that opportunity. My brother, my sister, there are opportunities aplenty in this world because you are serving the God of second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth and tenth and eleventh chances. You're serving a God who does not run out of chances. So opportunities will come. We don't have to look back and think ourselves failures. We have to look back and think ourselves successes because even with everything that was happening in our past, we're still here, right? You're still here. And sometimes we, look, sometimes we need to really just talk to the Lord, right? And let God know, I need you because I'm a mess. I, I'm, in a, I'm in a messy situation. I'm in, I'm in a state where I can't do it myself. I'm in a mess. And, and at some point, if you are going to change the trajectory of your life and your relationships, 
we're going to have to admit the truth. And I think for many of us, we're going to have to admit um, a, a very hard truth to accept, which is sometimes we don't pick things well or sometimes we don't make good decisions, right? At some point, we have to be self-aware enough to accept that our decision-making process is flawed and we have to make some changes. And when it comes to romantic relationships, when it comes to relationships where you are um, seeking or you are with your husband, wife, partner, whatever you want to call it in this day and age, we have to understand that, okay, maybe there are some processes that I'm using to make decisions and the processes aren't working, right? Because for some of us before we were married, and I know for some people who are still looking for that soulmate, you know, I know there have probably in your life been a number of times where you said to yourself, ah, this, this guy's the one. He's the one. Oh, he's tall. Oh, he's the one. He's handsome. He's the one. He makes me laugh. <laughs> he's the one. And then three to six months later, he is not the one. <laughs> he's not even number two. He's, he's not the one. Or, you know, you, you find a beautiful one. Oh, Pastor John, this lady, huh? she's my sunshine, she's my moon, she's my stars, she's my everything, Pastor John. I can't wait till you walk us down the aisle. And I'm like, I'm ready, bro. And then two to three months later, it's like, Pastor John, I didn't know demons were still on this earth, still, still inhabiting people in the form. Legion, I rebuke you. No, man. Can't be rebuking people. You don't know what... Sometimes our decision-making process leads us to the wrong people, right? And sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves. And, and just come, we all have a come to Jesus moment, and some of us have many of them. I'm telling you, some of us, we have many moments where you just have to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, next time, you just pick for me. You pick for me. You give me the criteria and you use that criteria, and you pick for me. And I'm here to tell you that if you invite Jesus to set the criteria for you, if you invite Jesus not only into your life in church, but into your relationships, if you invite Jesus into your business, if you invite Jesus into your family, if you invite Jesus into your life 360 degrees, I am here to tell you that your life will get better. There will be improvement. There will be improvement. Hallelujah. You, Jesus is not to be on the sideline. And sometimes we sideline Jesus when it comes to our relationships. Right? We, we side, when it comes to our marriages, we sideline Jesus. When it comes to our dating life, we sideline Jesus. When it comes to um, our, 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 our Tinder life, uh, swiping left or swiping right, look, invite Jesus because if you swipe on the wrong person, that, that, that's going to be hell on earth for you. Amen. So we have to invite Jesus into every aspect of our relationships, including our, relation, our, our romantic ones. And the Bible teaches us that as my soul goes, so my life follows. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, why would God send somebody into your life that is going to put your soul in jeopardy? Why would he not want to have input into the area of your life that's going to affect your trajectory the most? Why wouldn't he want input in that? And when Solomon, the, 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 the wisest man in the Old Testament, tells us to guard our hearts with all diligence, we should take notice of that. We really should. Because, and this is something I want us all to understand, affection makes you vulnerable. If you have affection for someone, it makes you vulnerable. That is why the relationships we have on a romantic level are so impactful in our lives. Because if you have affection for somebody, it makes you vulnerable. And the truth is, you can't have intimacy and affection without risk. If you're in a relationship 
but somebody and you decide, I'm going to date this person or moving forward, I want this person in my life for the rest of my life then we have to understand that we are assuming some risk. We are assuming some risk. And the way to mitigate that risk is to allow Jesus into our relationships so that he brings us the right relationships at the right time with the right people so that we have the right result. Can somebody say, I understand you, Pastor? All right. And at this stage, see, when you're in school, I know, okay, most of us went through high school already, even the people who are young here, right? Already through high school. When you're in high school and your heart gets broken, it's not a big deal. Because when you're in high school and your heart gets broken, all you're going to do is skip class. Oh, I broke my heart. I'm not going to school today and you don't go, right? And you take time to get over it. And then you talk to your friends, and they're like, oh, move on, uh, and then you move on. But if you're an adult, and your heart gets broken, and it impacts you in a real difficult way, you can't just say, well, I'm not gonna go to work today because my heart is broken. I'm not gonna uh, pay my rent today because my heart is broken. I'm not going to do my car payment because my heart is broken. Because if that's the stance you take, there's going to be a lot more broken than your heart. Your credit is going to be broken. (laughs) Your door is going to be broken as they take you out of there. So this is why it's so important for us to guard our hearts, right? Because if we don't guard our hearts, we expose ourselves to all kinds of trauma which disrupt our lives. And I think we have to come to grips with the realization that some attraction is actually distraction, right? The enemy can bring people and things into your life that seem attractive and distract you from your actual purpose. And we have to be careful if that happens because not everything that is good for your eyes is good for your life. Ooh, nobody can say amen that she's. Not everything that is good for your eyes is good for your life. And this is why we have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need to be able to discern what is for me and what is not for me. Because what is good for one person may not be good for you. And what is good for me may not be good for you. And what is good for you may not be good for me. And so we need the Holy Spirit to be able to discern what is actually for me. And I think we underestimate how intensely Satan can be involved in this area. We're unaware that the enemy is distracting people from their destiny. He is. And the enemy, this distraction leads to us losing time. We're losing time. The only thing you can't manufacture more of in this life is time. You can manufacture more money. You can manufacture more of everything. You can buy more houses, etc. But you cannot manufacture more time. And I think the enemy works at eating up our time. And because time is an irreplaceable asset, right? Because, it, you know, for those who are business-minded and, and really understand assets and liabilities, time is an irreplaceable asset because you can't get more of it. It's, it's a, it's a, so we have to pick our relationships well. We really have to pick our relationships well. Because if we don't and we allow time to be eaten up, that is where real regret and bitterness begins to generate in our hearts. Your soulmate is tied to your purpose. So you've got to be in your purpose in order for God to reveal your soulmate. Your soulmate is connected to the purpose that God has put in your life. And it's so crucial to be, see, many of us, you know, at times in our life, we find ourselves, am I in my purpose? We ask, am I doing the right thing? Has God put me in the right place, et cetera? And we ask these questions. And they're important questions to ask because it's important to be in your purpose because everything that God is bringing to your life is aligned with your purpose. 
And so if you're off track with your purpose, you're going to find yourself missing opportunities, including relationships, because you weren't on the track to meet them. There's a, a beautiful love story in the Bible uh, between two uh, people, a man and a woman named Ruth and Boaz. And Ruth is sort of this kind of, uh, she's, she's led a very difficult life, let me put it that way. And she's working in a field one day. And Boaz, who is this kind of big wig in the town and in the city, he comes by and he, you know, he, he sees her working and he, he notices her. And I think this story reveals a secret about finding your, your soulmate or keeping your soulmate. And that secret is get to work in your calling. Get to work in your calling. Get to work in the area of life and purpose that God has given you because God sends help. He doesn't send company. See, many of us have company, but what we need is help. Many of us have people around us, but the question you and I have to ask is, are the people who surround us helpful to my purpose? If you're surrounded by people who are not helpful to your purpose, I have a very unfortunate announcement to make to you, which is that they are eating your time. They are eating your time, and they're taking your time, time which could be directed at your purpose. And I think this is really important to understand. This is crucial to... See, there's a... Um, I do some work in a lot of other areas, and one of the areas I do help people is, like, building their network. And you have to understand and ask yourself, who's in your tribe? Like, who is it? And I'm not talking about your, look, I know a lot of people here are Ghanaians and, you know, whatever. You have a tribe, Ashanti, Fanti. Okay, that's great. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about who's in your tribe of people that you're moving in life with that are helping you accomplish your purpose. Do you have people who encourage you? Do you have people that help you? Do you have people that support you? Do you have people that keep you focused? Do you have people that don't allow you to get down on yourself? Do you have a circle of people that you can depend on? Do you have people that keep you accountable? That is your tribe, right? And you have to ask yourself, do I have people like that in my life? And you have to amplify that question with, okay, if I'm in a romantic relationship, if I'm seeing somebody as somebody I'm going to spend the rest of my life with, are, do their values align with my values? Do, does their purpose align with my purpose? Is this person going to encourage me? Is this person going to help me? Is this person going to keep me focused? Is this person going to keep me accountable? Or are they like the wonderful song of the 90s, TLC? Are they a scrub that can't get no love from me? You have to decide which side of the fence they're on. Hallelujah. That's from my, that's from my 90s babies, you know, my people, yeah. You have to decide. Because you can't, the one thing I don't want you, like, the one thing I hope that none of us would do in 2023 is waste time. That's my prayer for you. Honestly, that is my prayer for you. Because having been a pastor for like almost 20 years, long time, what I've realized is there are certain things we can pray that can be restored, but the one thing that we cannot restore is time. That's what I've come to realize. So I really pray that you don't, you know, lose time this year. And you know, I, I think the way that we look for our soulmates needs to be adjusted. And this is just for any, look, if you're married or you're, you're in a long-term relationship and you're, you're feeling good about things and you're like, yeah, this is good. Fantastic. Hallelujah. Thank God. But I, what I know is that people are always coming to other people for advice about how do I find the right person. And one of the things that I, I really have to emphasize and implore is that, look, the world is always about extremes, right? So in the church, the church is always on the extreme of, well, look at the inside of the person. Look at the character of the person. The person's personality is all that matters, right? That's what, you know, you get from the church. And the world is like, well, it's the look of the person, right? Is the person felt? Do they have style? Are they on Instagram? Do they have followers? Do they have this, that, that? And that's what the world puts out there. And they are two extremes. But what I am going to advocate is there has to be balance of both. 
There has to be balance. Because if you are looking for a romantic partner, let me tell you something. Let me tell you the truth coming from the pulpit. That person needs to be attractive to you. Oh, my goodness, no. That person needs to be physically attractive to you, right? Because God has made somebody for every person. But not only does that person have to be physically attractive to you, they've got to be internally attractive to you. They've got to have a character that's attractive to you. They've got to have a mind that's attractive to you. And they've got to have a purpose that's attracted to you, right? And we have to allow God to show us and prioritize in our lives uh, and balance in our lives this attractiveness physically with this attractiveness internally. Because if you go to the extreme on either side, you're going to find yourself in trouble. You're going to find yourself in trouble. So it, it's crucial to allow God that area in our lives, right? And for some people, some things matter more than others. So for some people, internal character is going to matter more than physical attractiveness. That's okay. For you, that, for somebody else, it might be the physical side is more important to me than the internal. Hey, that's, that's your boat. That's okay. You have to really understand and articulate these things for your life so that you don't pick wrong. We've got to understand how God is bringing these important uh, people into our lives so that we don't pick wrong, right? And I think oftentimes in religious circles, we just gloss over the physical, well, don't worry. If the person doesn't look the way you like, uh, you're going to grow to love them. Really? Really? We better be careful. Hallelujah. Because God wants you to have a relationship, romantic relationship, married, etc., that satisfies every level of your life. Every level of your life. And this is why it's important not to rush into things. Take your time. Take it easy. I know everything in this world is fast. Fast food, fast cars, fast everything. But in terms of your romantic relationships, I want to give you some advice. Take it slow. Take it slow. For, for some of us who have been around the block a little bit, Take it slow. Amen. Take it slow. Relax. Because if that's the right person for you, they're not going anywhere. If God has put that person in your life for, to align with your purpose, they're not going anywhere. God will work it out so that they're with you. So don't rush. Don't, don't. See, when God brings your soulmate into your life, there's no need for manipulation. You don't have to manipulate things. You don't have to manipulate the facts. You don't, when God brings people into your, when God brings the right person into your life, you're going to see that things will align so that your relationship will work. You know, my own wife, who is wonderful, hallelujah, you better start clapping. I'm not, I'm giving you a chance. I'm giving you time. I'm giving you time. I'm standing here, giving you time. I'm seeing who's not clapping because I know they're jealous. It's okay. I know, I know. You know, when I was thinking about marrying my own wife, like uh, before we um, got to that stage and, you know, I was thinking, yeah, should I date this girl? I'm not sure. Should I date this girl? Hey, there are a lot of options in this world. Amen? And there are a lot of handsome men in this auditorium and they know there's a lot of options. Hallelujah. If you're a handsome man, say yes. Okay. The ones who said no, <laughs> it's your loss. And so when I was thinking about, okay, is, is she the one for me? I asked God, God, if it's the right decision, you make things work for me. And I remember at the time, I was like trying to weigh my options, you know? There's plenty of fish in the sea, amen. And I'll never forget this. I was thinking about it, I said, okay, God, you choose. The next day. One girl I was interested, she called me. She said, you know what? It's not going to work between us. Somebody said, oh, God? Oh, jeez. And I said, why not? 
He said, I don't know, man. It's just not going to work. Listen, when you ask God to act, don't be surprised when he acts. Amen. Don't be surprised when he acts. And she's like, I, I don't think it's going to work. It's not. No, I don't think so. And, and she just cut me off. And I was like, wow. So God, does it mean that Theodora is the one for me? And internally, I heard a big, hey, my friend, go for it. Amen. I heard a big yes. I heard a big go for it. And I said to myself, but I, I don't know. Is this, is this the correct? Is this the right way to, should I? And God allowed me to take time to get to know her. And I was like, wow, this is a real lady. This is a lady. So demure, so nice. So, you know, I, I'm in love with my wife. So you guys can't. I mean, whether you like it or not, I don't even care. I, I just, uh, man, I don't care. I was like, what a lady. What a, like, what, what a nicely put together. And she could make jalof, which was like just a bonus for me. And I was like, I don't need much else. And, you know, and, and when God is, is working in your life, you'll see that the, 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 the alignment of agreement will also work. Because I remember I, I brought her around. We had a family gathering. I brought her around. And my mom was like, hmm, my friend, you better get married. You, you had better snap this girl up very, very quick. And I dated other girls, and all my mom had to say was nothing. So when it's time for God to do something in your life, you'll see that there's an agreement. Your, your whole life will begin to agree with the purpose and the plan that God has for you. And all I want to really do is encourage you that if you invite God to be your decision maker, things will flow much easier than if you decide, I'm going to be the decision maker for my own life. So I really want to encourage you, and I want to implore you. I, I, want to, I want to tell you that there is a God who is on your side and who wants to participate in the decision-making of your life, even your romantic relationships. And for those who are looking and searching and saying there's no good men out there, there's no good women out there, I want to tell you something. They are there, but God is hiding them until you are ready. So when you get ready, you'll begin to see them appear. Hallelujah. And so now... Like, take time, right? Take time. If, if you're in the situation where you're looking, take time. Because I do believe that God will reveal the right person to your life at the right time. And, man, let me tell you something. I know that there are married people and there are people in long-term relationships here. There is nothing better than knowing that somebody is on your side for life. Amen? There is nothing better than knowing that somebody is with you through the thick and the thin, through the trials, through the tough, through the heartache, through the, that somebody is not just there for the fair weather. Somebody is there. You know, when we do the vows, I'm going to wrap up. When we do the vows, we say for richer or for what? Hey, you said for richer or for richer? No. <laughs> for richer or for what? In sickness and in what? Both sides right? Both sides. And this is what you should be considering when you're looking for and seeking that long term. It's not always going to be up here. Sometimes life by necessity brings you down here. You need somebody who's going to be down here with you so that I can lift you up here when the appointed time comes. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm.